going on an adventure. So there's only one way to figure it all out. Unzip the archaeology. Make it naked. Saint Helena, one of the most influential women in history. In the early 4th century, she became a Christian before it was the fashion. Her son followed his mama's lead. And her son was none other than Constantine the Great, Emperor of Rome. Soon, Christianity was the official religion of the Roman Empire. In her 70s, Helena set out for the land of the Bible, single-handedly inventing the seniors' tour of the Christian holy sites. She decided where the most important events in Jesus' life happened. She built churches marking the birthplace of Jesus and John the Baptist. She found Joseph's carpentry shop, the crown of thorns, and the crucifixion cross, nails and all. To this day, every year, millions of pilgrims follow in the footsteps of Helena. But was she a competent archaeologist? Or was she just making it up as she went along? To find out, I'm going to take a look at some of her best work starting with the Church of the Holy Sepulchre in Jerusalem. The 1,600-year-old church, a maze of chapels, tombs, and passages, is the holiest site in Christianity. Legend says Helena built it. She claimed it was the site of Jesus' crucifixion, resurrection, and tomb, now marked by a church within a church. Helena said this was where Jesus was buried. And actually, if you just walk by over here, you see that there is some kind of structure. This seems to be, I don't know, some kind of family tomb. You can see the architecture. There were tombs here, and, it, and people were washed here, people were buried here, families mourned here. There's a whole network here. Was this the tomb that the Gospels identify as the place where Jesus was laid to rest for three days before the Gospels say that Jesus was resurrected. It was a tomb. We can see that it was a tomb. But was this the tomb of Jesus? Well, according to Helena, it was. And suddenly this tomb, this modest family tomb, turned into the Church of the Holy Sepulcher. Over the archaeology, you have layers of ar architecture, layers of faith, and an entire edifice of religion right here. I asked Father Leslie Hoppe, a Franciscan monk, about Helena's contribution to this holy site. Thank you. This Church of the Holy Sepulchre, what, 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 what's the meaning of this church for Christendom? Well, it houses the tomb of Jesus Christ, plus it also houses the rock of uh, Golgotha, where Jesus, is, was, where Jesus was crucified. When you say it's the tomb of Jesus, that means you basically believe Helena. Well, the, the tradition regarding the identification of this site as the place of Jesus' tomb was a tradition kept by the local Christian community of Jerusalem long before Helena came. But when she shows up and says, you know, let's build a church here, I mean, that's hundreds of years after the fact, right? Right. But what was her involvement here? Well, that's the question. Is the Church of the Holy Sepulchre really built over the tomb of Jesus? And if it was, was it really Helena who built it? Before I can answer this, I need to know who was the sizzling senior, the patron saint of divorcees, treasure hunters, and archaeologists. I got the lowdown on Helena from Annette Yoshiko Reed, professor at McMaster University. Well, Helena was um, the mother of Constantine. She came from extremely humble origins, an innkeeper, 
or she may have been even a prostitute, that she may or have been... a madame running a brothel. Yeah, something to that effect. Innkeeper. The in old the innkeeper. Of, yeah. I think inns in those days were a little bit different. <laughs> But whatever she, whatever she was, she definitely came from very humble origins. She married Constantine's father, who also came from humble origins. He was the son of a goat herd. So a goat herd married a madame, and together they, they had an emperor. Yeah, they were very common people. Around the time that Constantine was 20, Constantius spurned Helena. Got abandoned her. Him, got himself a trophy wife. Oh, he got himself actually more than a trophy wife. The person who he married in her place was the daughter of the Augustus, this main emperor at the time. So he married very, very far up. Constantine's father becomes emperor, but not for long. He dies in bed one year later, leaving the crown to Constantine. At the time, Rome is pagan. Christians are being fed to the lions. Legend says that in 312, Constantine is leading his army into battle when this happens. He sees a cross in the sky and knows he must fight in the name of Jesus. He wins. It appears his mother had the right idea. Within a century, Christianity will become the official religion of the empire. It will strengthen and spread for the next thousand years unstoppable until the Muslims gained control of Jerusalem in the 12th century. At that time, the key to the Holy Sepulchre is taken from the Christians and given to a Muslim family for safekeeping. For more than 800 years, Waji Nuseba's ancestors have held the key to the church's only door. I am the doorkeeper and the recorder of the church. Oh, the doorkeepers doorkeepers of the church. Of this church. Also, before that, my father, now I am. Later, maybe my son. Deep inside the Holy Sepulchre, there's another, less famous church, St. Helena's Chapel, where Helena is said to have discovered the true cross. It is just below the site of the crucifixion, also known as Calvary. And this is under Calvary. This is the bottom of the hill. You see the hill? Original hill, uh, the cross discovered right here. The cross was discovered right here? Right here by Constantine Helena. So this is called the Church of the Cross or the Church of St. Helen. Because so she found the cross where? Right here. Right this here. This is the place where she discovered the cross. If Helena was right, she just achieved one of the greatest archaeological feats of all time. But she didn't rest on her Roman laurels. Next, she builds in Bethlehem. In 306 AD, Constantine becomes emperor of Rome. He makes his mother, Helena, empress. But she shocks Rome by adopting a new, illegal religion. He has two choices. He can feed her to the lions and make Christianity legal. Cut to 325 AD. Christianity has become Constantine's favorite pastime. He built St. Peter's. He heads up the first official Christian council, and he sends his mama on an all-expenses-paid trip to the Holy Land to build churches in his name. I'm standing in front of the Church of Nativity in Bethlehem. This is the traditional place where Jesus is supposed to have been born, in a manger. This is where Helena came in 320, let me see here. I happen to just have a handy tourist brochure. 325, thank you very much. When, she came here in 325, right? Nice to meet you. What's your name? Nidal. Nidal, are you a tour guide here? Yes. So what's the story with this church? What do you mean by the story? But you're looking at the Church of Nativity. And, and this is a traditional place where Jesus was born, right? It's not traditional. This is the place where all denominations decide this is the place. Helena heads to Bethlehem to build a church marking the very spot where Jesus was born. Funnily enough, there's already a shrine here, a pagan temple. Christians believe the pagans built the temple to cover up the holy site. Others believe Helena wanted to turn a pagan site into a Christian one. Whatever the answer, Helena knocks down the pagan temple and builds a church for Jesus. She even identifies the specific place of the miracle birth. 
That's the traditional place of Jesus' birth, right over there. The star marks the spot. This is where the virgin birth is supposed to have taken place. There's a Helena, Helena mosaic there dating back to the uh, fourth century. And if you notice, the whole place has the shape of a cross. There's two entrances. This is the head where Jesus is uh, uh, supposed to have been born. And then it goes right down like that in the shape of a cross. We'll let the faithful pass here. Let's get out of these good people's way. 1,500 years later, away from the tourists, the original mosaic floor of the church Helena built is hidden under this trap door. But that won't stop the naked archaeologist. Well, look at this. There's no mosaic here, so I can go here. This is supposedly the original mosaic. So we're talking Helena's time. We're talking 1,600 years old. And you can see it's about three, four feet under the present floor. Gorgeous mosaic. Isn't it beautiful? OK. In the fourth century, Helena is the answer to the Christians' prayers. Just 15 years earlier, they were forced to worship in secret. Now they have a church the size of heaven and money to burn. This is just the beginning. Next, Helena embarks on a mission to mark all the holy places with churches. She even finds the bones of the three magi, the thorns from Jesus' crown, and the true cross. What's her secret? Flexibility. When archaeology fails, she switches to miracles, visions, and torture. So one of the interesting ways that Helena, before she became Saint Helena, used to find out where the true cross was, was to throw this learned Jew person such as myself, into this well. And then after seven days in the well, I wouldn't have lasted seven days, he finally came up with a theory of where the true cross really was. And then she let him climb, whoa, <laughs> out of the well. No wonder he confessed. I would, have, I would have pointed at any tree just to get out of that. Look at that. Ancient well, deep, miserable, full of bacteria. Why did I go in there? Archaeological ballet. Torturing Jews doesn't sound like very saintly behavior to me. I asked Annette Reed to tell me more about Helena's research techniques. In some traditions, she brings all of the Jews in the city together, finds the most learned of them, and tortures them in order to find out where the place is, because she knows that they, there's memory there. So this holy woman gathers the yeah. wise and tortures them to get the information. So that's one version of the story. That's, that's one form of archaeology, which I'm glad <laughs> yeah, has been abandoned. Yes. <laughs> and another version of the legend, um, it's because of divine inspiration that she's able to tell where the various spots are. Divine inspiration is divine. nicer than divine, torture. Yes. The stories go on to say that Helena finds three crosses. To find out which one belonged to Jesus, she needs a miracle. The one that heals a sick woman, she declares, the true cross. Helena orders the church built. Holy Sepulchre is born. As for the cross... She split it up. One part was in Jerusalem, one part was in Rome, and one part was in Constantinople. She broke the, the true cross? Yes. This was a very common thing to do with relics during this time. Was it's like had... an archaeologist today wanting to give yeah. to different museums. Yes, well, so there you go. <laughs> and I take this jar and break yeah. it. Each piece is as powerful as the whole in terms of being a witness. And there's a part in Jerusalem, a part in Rome, and a part in her son's new capital, Constantinople. A triangle a in terms of the triangle. most important places within what is becoming a Christian Roman Empire. Right. In Jerusalem, the relic of the true cross was kept in the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. Over 1,600 years later, I'll get a chance to see it. Constantine the Great, Emperor of Rome. In 325, he sent his mother to the Holy Land. There, she is said to have built many churches, including the Holy Sepulchre in Jerusalem. It's here that Helena reportedly found the true cross. And where now, 1,600 years later, a sliver is still kept under lock and key. Father Theopolis, the Greek Orthodox patriarch, has agreed to show it to me. 
Hi. Hi. And uh, so you have a piece of the true cross here? Right oh. side. You're welcome. Right now. Give me a second, please. Oh, wow. That's some key. Yeah, that's right. It's very old. It's the old keys of the... They don't make keys like this anymore. Well, they're uh, only for preservation and uh, for antiquity reasons. <laughs> This little... The, the central part. The small part, no. which is inserted in the bigger one. This is from the original cross of Jesus Christ. Are there any, like, miracles associated with the... Uh, of course, there are many, many cross? miracles and uh, many personal stories about uh, the Holy Cross. We have the little service, which is called the service for the sanctification of the water. And uh, once this water is blessed, uh, it never decays. It doesn't evaporate? It doesn't evaporate, doesn't decay. And here also we have um, relics. You mean bones? There are bones, but there are relics together with skin. For instance, here is the right hand of Mary Magdalene. The right hand of Mary Magdalene? Yes, yeah, that's right. It is a hand in there, isn't it? Yes, there is. There's yes. metal, like a metal glove around it. Yes, but you can see the bone inside there. I see the bone. That's you the bone. See, that's yes, the bone of Mary look, Magdalene. The, look the hand here. Yeah. Yes. Inside there are bones. Yes. A skeptic might point out that none of these sacred relics has been scientifically tested. No carbon-14 dating. No labs. Add to that, there are enough slivers of the true cross to build a house, and even Father Hoppy is suspicious. What about the whole story of finding the cross? Well, the. The earliest story that associates Helena with the finding of the cross comes from about 70 years after the event. Eusebius doesn't mention Helena nor the cross. It's only with a history written by Gelasius in 390 that you have the association of Helena with the finding of the cross at this church. So do you think she had something to do with it or she just got kind of retroactive praise? My own personal view is that I'm doubtful that Helena had anything to do with the finding the cross here. So who did find the true cross? And what, if anything, did Helena discover? <laughs> Helena's influence is still felt around the world. For example, in Toronto, I met with Father Kutu at St. Helen's Roman Catholic Church. To my amazement, locked away in the most secret recesses of the church, I discovered that here, too, there is a piece of the true cross. Could you tell me a little bit about this statue here? That's uh, St. Helen. And uh, she became a Christian at the age of 63, converted. Now, I understand that in this church, there are pieces of the cross. Mm -hmm. So you actually have relics? Yeah, we have one. It is, uh, it's been here for a long time. I don't know when it came in, but I presume it is here since the church was started. I could show it to you if you, you come inside. Yeah, sure, you have yeah. it. And this is, the, this is the safe? That's the safe, and... Uh, you keep it locked most yeah. of the time? Yes, always. This is a real safe. When you said safe, I thought one of those little things. I didn't no, realize. this is a walk-in. Something that you Thick can walk walls in. walls for fire. Oh. And that's this piece. Can you see that? Yeah. So, um, so this is... That sliver in the middle. Oh, that tiny, tiny little that sliver. Right. But the little and sliver is in a shape of a cross was put, right? There's that's two, sli right. There's that's two right. slivers. That's right. And that, according to the church's tradition, came from the actual cross that Jesus was crucified on mm -hmm. and that St. Helena identified. That's right. Are we allowed to open this? Yeah. Yeah? Oh. Oh, I see. And that's... Um... So it's encased that's, inside. That's right, around the center of the cross. Is it more symbolic for you, or do you actually believe that this is a piece of the cross? I just look at it, it helps me to think of Jesus. I don't go on, no longer on the questions. Where it is the true cross, it wasn't true cross. Uh, it, it's irrelevant for it. To me, it just helps me to focus. Once I'm, I'm focusing Jesus' life, that's it. Whether or not Helena discovered the true cross, she has helped tens of millions of people focus on Jesus. She invented the idea of the Christian pilgrimage. 
At Christmas, the Church of the Nativity in Bethlehem is packed with pilgrims. At Easter, it's the Holy Sepulchre Church in Jerusalem. Christians believe these churches are here because Helena said so. Archaeology can't tell us much about her, but there is someone who can, an ancient eyewitness. Helena's traveling companion to the Holy Land, one-time bishop, the historian Eusebius. It's difficult to know from the early accounts how much of this she actually did. The earliest account is in Eusebius, and he doesn't mention the true cross at all. He has actually Constantine and Bishop Macarius of Jerusalem being responsible for the Holy Sepulcher. Is she involved with the Holy Sepulcher? According to Eusebius, she isn't. I mean, one of the things that I find kind of striking is that within Eusebius' account is that he makes this offhand reference to Helena wanting to pray in the places of importance to Christ's life and wanting to walk in the footsteps of Christ. This focus on the physical places of Jesus' life on, and trying to unearth them. That's I mean, Helena seems, stuff? Yeah, I think it is. And there'd been some pilgrims that had gone before, but they were all scholars. They were curious for other reasons. But after Helena goes and, and builds churches and then also makes this attempt to walk in the footsteps of Christ, there are just streams of pilgrims who come. It's the basis for the whole way of thinking about the past that modern archaeology in the Holy Land is based on. She's like actually the first kind of to create a bridge to the historical Jesus. Yeah, she actually she is in a lot of ways of this real concern to, to be a Christian is to walk in the footsteps of Christ in a physical sense. So how important is she to Christianity? Well, if you try to imagine what it was like in the, in the fourth century for the empress to come to Palestine and to kneel in Christian churches, that's a powerful statement. So it, it does lend a kind of the support of the imperial family to this new religion. And if you compare the situation that the church faced at the beginning of the fourth century to the one it faced at the end of the fourth century. It's night and day difference. At the beginning of the fourth century, the church was suffering persecution. At the end of the fourth century, pilgrims are coming from all over the empire. And I think Helena's contribution is very critical. We may never know if Helena found the actual gospel sites. For most, it's a matter of faith. What we do know is that she practically invented the idea of Christian holy sites and she helped make Christianity the official religion of the Roman Empire. So what became of Helena? She died in her son's arms in Constantinople, destined to become a Christian relic in her own right. In the ninth century, her bones were moved to the Abbey of Hautevilliers in France, where Dom Perignon invented his famous bubbly beverage a popular pilgrim destination.